everybody. Welcome to the 13 o'clock podcast. This is episode nine. And we did a thing about a serial killer last week, uh, the original Night Stalker. And after we did that, I kind of got interested in other sort of lesser known serial killer cases. But I thought I'd take it back to the Victorian era. And this topic, I uh, actually got the idea from a really cool uh, British mini series. It's on Netflix if you want to watch it. It's called Murder Maps. And it's kind of a cool uh, show where they talk about um, it's from the Victorian era to, I believe, World War II was the last one. And they kind of talk about the most spectacular crimes that happened in London around those time periods. And they mentioned Jack the Ripper, but, you know, since so much is known about that, they kind of went off in different directions and talked about lesser known ones. And one of the cases they talked about is actually one of the guys I'm going to talk about today. And they mentioned the other guy I'm going to talk about today. And I wanted to put these two guys together because they had a lot of weird similarities. Uh, They're both convicted serial killers. Uh, both were, uh, poisoners. They, you know, they used poison for the murders that they were finally convicted for. And incidentally, they were both considered suspects in the Jack the Ripper case. So there's a possibility that one of these two guys could be Jack. Could have been Jack the Ripper. Sure. Were they believed to be, they were believed to be Jack the Ripper, or they were believed to possibly be Jack the Ripper back in those days too, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, one is more likely than the other, Okay. but, um, you know, and there were obviously a lot of suspects. I think at the time, 80 people were detained. All right. Um, but the first guy I want to talk about, uh, the, is this going to be the case of George Chapman? Now, interestingly, George Chapman was the man that Inspector Frederick Aberline, who was the main Jack the Ripper investigator. And if you saw the movie From Hell, uh, that was the character that Johnny Depp played. Uh, uh, Frederick Aberline actually thought that George Chapman was the most likely suspect. And even though there are some other suspects that are kind of likely to, I mean, this guy, just by his movements alone, it kind of makes you really suspicious. Okay. This guy, he was actually Polish, born in Poland, and George Chapman was not his real name. That was an alias. Uh, He went by several of them. His birth name was Severin Kozlowski. I hope I said that right. I'm sorry, Polish people. And he, in the end, he was convicted of killing three women, although they think there might have been more. Now, he was actually a surgeon's assistant. He trained under a surgeon when he was a kid in Poland. And, you know, surgeon's assistant nurse back then would have just been, you know, sticking leeches on people and shit like that. (laughs) But, um, you know, since some people at the time thought, oh, Jack the Ripper must have had some medical knowledge, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, that ticks that box there. Now, he moved to London, they think, in 1887 or 1888. Now, if you know anything about the Jack Jack the Ripper case, you know that the Ripper murders took place in 1888. And George Chapman specifically, not just moved to London, he moved to Whitechapel. Where they happened. Where they happened. Right. Now, he didn't live super close to where the, you know, the crime scenes, but he did live in that area. Now, he had a wife back in Poland, but evidently he said, fuck her, and he left her back in Poland because when he got in London, he married another Polish girl who was there, uh, named Lucy Bedevsky. I think bigamy was kind of common back then. There was no it way to really mu- yeah, check. Yeah, there was no way to really check, especially right. country to country. Yeah. So he probably figured, hey, why not? You know, yeah, marry another here's one. Here's another one. Now, it should be noted that his wife, Lucy, was, <laughs> other than his original Polish wife, his wife, Lucy, was the only woman he was involved with that he didn't kill, allegedly. Okay. <laughs> so I think she was all right. But uh, he had two kids with her also. And his original wife found out and she got pretty pissed, obviously. The one back in Poland. The one back in Poland found out about it. I don't know if she did anything about it. Like, I don't know if she, like, you know, marched into London going, yo, motherfucker, or anything like that. But, you know. So, So even though he had a wife in London, he started taking up with other women. Uh, He had about four mistresses. 
What did he do? But for he would introduce them as his wife. I, but he worked as a uh, surgeon's assistant, okay. barber okay. type of thing. All right. Yeah. So he took up with these women. He said they were his wives. Some sources call them his common law wives, whatever. Okay. Um, three of these women mysteriously ended up dead. Now, no one noticed anything. Like, he, they didn't suspect anything at first. Uh, his first two victims were named Mary Spink, was the first one. And, oh my goodness. Oh, no, sorry. <clears throat> got Gazoon me. tight. Yeah, got me. And Bessie Taylor was the second one. And they died from quote-unquote illnesses, so no one thought anything about it. You know, oh, they got sick, they died. Right. However... Then he took a mistress named Maud Marsh. And same thing happened with her. She was very young, very pretty girl. Um, I believe he was running a pub and she worked there. Okay. She was a lot younger than him. And her mother lived there as well. She came down with some mystery illness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he seemed very you know, doting on her and he was all upset and calling mm -hmm. doctors and trying to figure out what was the matter. I don't have any idea what could be wrong with her. Took her to the hospital, whole nine yards. They had no idea what was hmm. the matter with her. And so she just got sicker and sicker and her mother called in another doctor. Yeah. And I don't think he wanted her to call in another doctor. Yeah. He's yeah. like, my doctor's fine. Right, you know, yeah. the other doctor's going to say the same thing right. that my doctor said, you know, it's fine. But the mother was like, you know, I want her to get better. So she called in her own doctor. Second opinion. To get a second opinion, right. which, you know, reasonable enough. Right. Now this other doctor came in and at first he wasn't quite sure what was wrong either. He conferred with the first doctor and they're like... Maybe somebody could be poisoning her. Yeah. Because the symptoms were kind of similar to arsenic hmm. poisoning. Now, Maud Marsh did end up dying. Mm -hmm. And because of the mother's suspicions, because of the doctor's suspicions, uh, George Chapman was arrested. And they actually found out about the other two women and had them exhumed. Yeah, they found out all the dead women in his past. Yeah. Right. So, you know, his other two mistresses. And they did an autopsy, too. They did. Yeah. And they found out that these three women had indeed been poisoned. Mm -hmm. The poison he used was, uh, it was actually um, over the counter. You could buy it at a pharmacy. It was called Tartar Emetic. Mm -hmm. And it has a metallic uh, element in it called antimony, yeah. which is very poisonous in high doses. Right. But like I said... You could buy it. Yeah. It was for colds and flus and things like that. And it turned out that they found out that George Chapman had bought a very large uh, supply of tartar emetic hmm. from a chemist in Sussex. And he had been administering this to the women over hmm. a long period of time. So it looked like a long illness. And then finally they died. And antimony poisoning is very, very similar to arsenic poisoning. Very painful. Very... You know, a very it's lingering, a lingering death. death. Yeah, very unpleasant. And so it turned out because of the mother's suspicions, because of the doctor's suspicions, George Chapman was arrested after they did the autopsies and found the poison. And he ended up... Now, I guess, and I'm not sure like what the law, like why the law was like this, mm -hmm. but apparently he could only be tried for the one murder Right. I don't know if it was because the other two women were too uh, degraded, like to for it to stick. Or I think Victorian era law was pretty uh, convoluted. Well, and because I think the law in the UK at the time—I mm. mean, if you killed somebody, they pretty much just hung your ass. They didn't right, fuck yeah. around. So it's just like, well, one murder is as good as twenty. It's like right. you're, we're going to hang right. you anyway. So, so, she, so he actually only ended up being. Uh, convicted for the death of Maud Marsh. Well, that's all they needed. That's all they needed. Right. Because, like I said, um, you know, so they hanged him uh, mm. at Wandsworth Prison in 1903. Now, the weirdest thing about this guy is that he didn't really have a particular motive. No motive. 
The only no time money. he got any financial gain, I mean, you know, a lot of times these poisonings, it's for financial gain, usually. Mm -hmm. um, the only financial gain he got that they know of was one of the women left him 500 pounds. That's nothing. Which was a lot of money at the time, but yeah. not a fortune by any means. Probably not worth committing murder. He was a businessman. I right. Mean, he, had a, he had a pub. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he wasn't broke. And I mean, you know, right. he was a skilled person. And so it would seem like the other two women, he didn't get anything out of it. Could it have been Munchausen by proxy? See, that's what I'm thinking. Mm. Because maybe he got off mm. on on caring for these sick women and the attention that it afforded him from people going, oh, poor guy. And like, right. you know, his, what? well, people thought it was his wives, but they were actually his mistresses. But yeah, because they, the doctors said that he did seem genuinely concerned. Yeah. Right. And so he seemed very grief stricken when they died. I'm thinking it must have been Munchausen by proxy. It might have been. Because initially, I would have thought maybe he was just a sadist. Maybe right. he enjoyed watching women suffer. Maybe. However, maybe. like right. you said, every all of the witnesses said he seemed genuinely sad. And ge when they died, and he was upset, and he cared for them. And in, in case any, someone in the audience doesn't know, maybe you should explain what Munchausen by proxy is. We're taking it for granted that people know what that is. Yeah. I mean, okay. you know, yeah, Munchausen by proxy is basically when someone... and. In a lot of cases, it's mothers or, you know, parents with their children. Oh. They will deliberately make their children or make someone sick mm -hmm. because they get attention and uh, sympathy. Over taking care of them. About taking care of them. It's, you know, it's right. it's almost kind of like a martyr complex. Like, right. oh, look at all of the trials I have to go through. Although, and, I, in Munchausen by proxy, they're not actually trying to kill the kid. No. But they want to keep the child ill. Right. So they keep getting sympathy. They keep getting... And in this case, it looked like he was in a way trying to kill her. Although he could have killed her a lot quicker, probably. Using That's what money. I mean. Because it seemed like... Right. I mean, like I said, it's very poisonous in high doses. Right. But he would just give her like a little bit at a time. Now, why, now why did the inspector have him as a ripper suspect? What because what happened... One, serial killer. Okay. Two... An interesting thing was that the Ripper murders stopped when George Chapman went to the United States. Now, when George Chap right around the time George Chapman arrived in the United States, in New York City specifically, there was a murder of a prostitute named Carrie Brown hmm. in New York City. Very, very similar hmm. to the Ripper murders. She was mutilated, right. you know, middle-aged prostitute. Ripper style. Very Ripper style. Right. And certainly at the time, the newspapers in New York, Jack the Ripper arrives on U.S. shores. Okay. Right, and it was a big deal. It was in right. all the media at the time because it was so similar. So they're not, I mean, they're not entirely sure because, like I said, George Chapman had a number of aliases. Right. So they're not sure exactly. They knew he was in the U.S., but they don't know if he arrived before or after the Carrie Brown murder, but it was right around the time of that happening. So in general, the timeline, the inspector, the investigation showed that wherever he was, Ripper murders happened, and right. wherever he was not, they ceased. Exactly. Okay. Because they did stop, because he left, right. you know, he left for the United States, and the Ripper right. murders stopped. So that could support the idea that maybe he had two separate issues. He may have right. had Munchausen by proxy on one hand, and then, on, and then he had another gig uh, as the Ripper. Yeah. Killing two different kinds of women. For, yeah. For two different purposes. Right. And maybe two different forms of emotional gratification. Maybe. Because honestly, it seems to me like the only argument against him being the Ripper. Hmm. I mean, and like I said, there are other li likely suspects as well. I'm not saying that he was the guy. But the only arguments against it are like, well, serial killers tend to stick to one modus operandi. It's right. that they don't usually poison their acquaintances and then go out and hack up prostitutes. However, it has happened. It's right. not impossible. Um, you know, usually serial killers will stick to one method, but not always. Um, so it seems, and like I said, they're not real sure if he was right. responsible for the Carrie Brown because they're not entirely sure when he got to New York, although it was around that time. But then that gets back to my hypothesis as he was the Ripper. Yeah. He had, he was a serial killer and he also happened to have Munchausen by proxy. He wasn't really trying to kill those women. 
He was just right. trying to get fame or what, what, attention yeah. for taking care of them. Maybe right. in, almost in a form of it, uh, maybe like atonement. Yeah. I'm a caring guy. <laughs> that's know? actually, that's a yeah. good hypothesis. I'm trying to save women. And that's then a I'm, good and hypothesis. And while nobody's watching, he's out there killing them. Yeah. Almost like a, like a weird, like Jekyll and Hyde. Like a Jekyll thing. and Hyde type yeah. deal. But, you know, a killer either way. Right. He's killing them, killing them through both It names. should be noted, too, that... Um, maybe his, it's atonement. He's yeah. killing strangers, so he's sacrificing his own the, his own wife and the people that he loved to atone for the for, random murders. Right. Who knows? Something yeah. weird like that. That's actually kind of a good... I never thought yeah. of it that way, but that's actually... Kind of like how Albert Fish would stick needles in himself. Yeah. To atone for, for the stuff that he had done. Yeah. Look up Albert Fish, you guys. That's some yeah. sick shit. Ooh. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we might do a show on him one day, too. Right. That's a sick motherfucker. <laughs> it should also be noted that uh, George Chapman's wife, the second one, the, the second one, Polish one, in London, mm-hmm. she told Inspector Aberline... Mm-hmm. That her husband would often go out at night and she didn't know where he was. All right. And she also said that, um, I'm not sure if this is the same. Actually, his original wife said that he was a wife beater. And it was known that all of the other women that were his mistresses, they had also complained that he had beat them up. So he was clearly a violent, misogynistic type of guy. Right. His original wife even claimed that he had tried to strangle her and that he had a knife under the pillow and that he said he was going to behead her. And she said he even told her where he was going to bury her body, what story he was going to tell, like, you know, to tell people where she Same. went and stuff like that. So not a good guy. No. Not a good guy. No, no matter how you uh, you slice it. Freak. Freak. Yeah. Definitely. And like I said, you know, because they said, oh, it's it's rare for a serial killer to change his method, blah de blah There's also some, people wonder whether he spoke good enough English right. at the time, you know, that he could have done it. Um, but also, again, it should be noted, too, that his description matched the description somebody saw Mary Jane Kelly, who was the fifth... Uh, of the canonical five Jack mm. the Ripper victims. There are actually 11 uh, murders of women that could have been Jack the Ripper, but those mm. five are the ones that they know were the same guy. Uh, she was the fifth one, Mary Jane Kelly, and someone saw her with a man shortly before her murder, and George Chapman's description fit his very closely. Yeah, I think it was the description of the clothes and stuff. Uh, yeah. The hat, yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, yeah, I think they said he looked swarthy and had a mustache or something like that. Right. And... So, you know, so he was someone who looked like him was seen with one of mm. the victims. So could have been him. He, like I said, Aberline certainly thought it was him. But, you know, we'll probably never know. will never know who the Ripper We'll probably was. never know. Case is too old. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, but uh, he, he was hanged for the three poisonings. And that was the end of that guy. Now... I guess I'm going to close this. Now, the second guy I want to talk about... Actually, let me take a break first, and then we'll get into the second guy, who was kind of similar in a lot of ways, but also kind of a weirdo and kind of a dumbass, I want to say. <laughs> like, he got caught out of his own dumbass, right, really? <laughs> but okay, so we're going to take our first break right now, and we'll be right back in just a few minutes. I would like to take a second and thank Subculture Corsets and Clothing for sponsoring Project I Radio and my show. While listening to my podcast, please take a second and visit their website at www.subculturecorsets.com. They carry a wide selection of corsets, rockabilly, gothic, steampunk, and pinup clothing, shoes, and accessories. Again, their website is subculturecorsets.com, or if you're in the Jacksonville, Florida area, stop by their store in the Avenues Mall. And if you like to save money, use the discount code 13 o'clock when checking out and save 10% off your entire order. By the way, if you're a curvy girl, Subculture did not forget about you. They carry size 4 to 4X, and guys, they have men's clothing and shoes as well. So go shop at subculturecorsets.com now and use the discount code 13 o'clock for a 10% discount. Okay, talking about serial killers, poisoners, Jack the Ripper suspects. Okay. And next we will consider the case of Dr. Thomas Neal Cream. <laughs> Thomas Cream. I know, which like sounds <laughs> Did he like he make that name up. 
I don't think he did, actually. That's like a porn name. I was going to say, it sounds like a porn name. <laughs> Thomas Neil Green. It's okay, all these people are dead. They can't kill us now. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> so we can make fun of them if we want to. They all, it's funny, in because, in, uh, you know, if you watch the YouTube video, I'll have, like, pictures of these dudes, but they all look like that, too, with those big, giant, epic mustaches yeah. and fucking, I don't Guys, know. They had a thing for facial hair back then. They did. It, yeah. was, it was pretty epic, though, I gotta mm. say. Now, Dr. Cream, uh... He's also been considered by some to have been the Ripper, um, although there are some things against it. But he was also a poisoner. Um, George Chapman was actually known as the Burrow Poisoner, and Thomas Neal Cream is known as the Lambeth Poisoner. Also a serial killer. I don't think I've ever heard of this guy. Yeah. Have I heard of this guy? I don't think so, huh? Yeah. See, I think when we watched Murder Maps, they yeah. talked about the George Chapman case in quite a bit, and they mentioned this guy. Oh, but not in detail. In similarity, but yeah, not right. not okay. in detail. Gotcha. But he is on the suspect list. Okay. Although it probably wasn't him, but, you know, you never know. Um, he was actually uh, Scottish. He was from Glasgow. Although when he was four years old, his family moved to Canada. And so he grew up in Canada, and he was actually a doctor. He went to medical school. Interestingly, his thesis in medical school was about chloroform, huh. which I'm sure would come in handy much later. Yeah. <laughs> now, the reason why that he is, and this is pretty much the only reason he's considered, other than being a serial killer, the only reason that he is considered a Jack the Ripper suspect is that when he was hanged, the hangman claimed that before he died, his last words were, I am Jack the... Ugh. Yeah, I've heard that story. Yeah. And then he died. Now, it should be noted that no one else heard him say that. Right. And, you know, it would have been like big bragging rights for that hangman to go, I hang Jack the Ripper, motherfucker. Right. You know what I mean? So, you have to take that story with a grain of salt. Another thing that could have happened is, is that... The guy was getting ready to die, and in desperation, he might have tried that ploy to hold up the execution. Oh, yeah, that's a, yeah. To live for a little bit. It's like, longer. wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. You're Jack the Ripper? Yeah, I'm Jack the Ripper. Yeah, I'll, well, yeah, I'll yeah. tell you the whole I'll story. I'll tell you the whole story. You yeah. just take this new song. Could have been that. <laughs> it could have been that, yeah. But so this guy, like I said, this guy, similar, you know, similar kind of method of killing as George Chapman, but he seemed like a sadist but he also seemed like he was trying to get financial gain out of it although he mm -hmm. went about it in the stupidest fucking way possible i have to say and it ended up getting him caught but he kind of went all over like i said he went to canada and he went to scotland and then he went to he actually married uh his first wife his wife flora a year later she got pregnant he gave her an abortion hmm? yeah. yeah wow well, he was a doctor. Okay. Guess he could do it. Although I don't think he was very good at doing abortions. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll get into that a little bit later. But then she later died of quote unquote consumption. Okay. No one thought anything of it at the time. But in light of later events, you know, they went back and were like, yeah, he probably offed her too. But he went to uh, London for his postgraduate, went back to Canada. And then... When he was in Canada, he had a little office there, a little doctor's office. And a woman named Kate Gardner, uh, he was supposedly having an affair with her. And had apparently, uh, he had apparently knocked her up. Mm -hmm. She was found dead in the alley behind his office. Still pregnant. She had been poisoned with chloroform. Now, Cream said, I can't believe that's that dude's name. Do we have to call him that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Cream. That's so that's like Dr. Moist. That's like that's so nasty. <laughs> that's ridiculous. It's such a gross word. It's ridiculous. It's such a gross word. But uh so this is okay, now this is the kind of shit that kept getting this dude into trouble. Here's what he would do. He would kill a woman, usually by poisoning her. Then he would write a letter to some prominent person and say you killed this woman, and I'm going to tell the police unless you give me X amount of money. What? Yeah, that's How what that I mean. work. That's what I mean. How would this work? How would this supposed to? Yeah. I guess he was supposed to. I guess he thought he could frighten people. He's trying to frame people. Yeah, he he was trying to frighten people into giving him right. money. Because he's like, well, even if you don't get convicted, you know, you'll have to go to the police, and they'll right. think you're a murderer, and blah blah, and it'll ruin your reputation or whatever. I don't know what the dude was thinking. Mm. He was kind of an idiot. 
<laughs> but anyway. Weird. So they found this dead woman mm-hmm. in Canada behind, you know, pregnant chloroform. And uh, he was trying to... Yeah, he didn't say how he killed him. How was he killing him? Chloroform. Oh, just chloroform to death? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. They OD, OD, OD'd her. He OD'd, yeah. Poisoned yeah, by yeah. He poisoned him with that. So he claimed that a uh, another local businessman had made her pregnant mm-hmm. and killed her. What? No one fell for it. Right. Everyone said, no, it was you. So he took off to the U.S. <laughs> As you would. Dummy. Because he thought, yeah. <laughs> But as you'll see, he did not learn from that. No? Okay. He did not learn. Okay. Next, he turns up in Chicago. And he opens up a little office in the red light district. Okay. Giving illegal abortions to prostitutes. Right. Which, like you know. You do. Needed service, <laughs> perhaps, even though it was illegal at the time. But yeah. like I said, he either was not very good at abortions or he was just super poison happy. Right. Because... Uh, what ended up having the f- he was first investigated in 1880, and uh, his this woman was uh, Marianne Faulkner, and he had supposedly given her abortion and she died, but there wasn't enough evidence, so he skated on that one. Another one of his patients died after being treated by him, and that and in that case, he tried to blackmail the pharmacist who gave her a prescription. Hmm. Like he wrote her, a, wrote him a letter and said, "You killed this with your poison that you sent her." Right. You know what I mean? And the pharmacist is like, "Whatever, fuck you, dude. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about." <laughs> and then a year later, there's another woman named Alice Montgomery. She died of actually strychnine poisoning, not chloroform, and uh, she had had an abortion also, and it was not. It was only a block from his office, so they're not entirely sure they know she was murdered they don't know if it was him but he was right there and you know he was an abortionist he was poisoning people allegedly so they thought that was him but it was never pinned on him what what is the actual motive is there a motive to this? that's what i mean i'm not really sure it's like he tried extortion and blackmail right i don't know if it ever actually was there a sexual motive I don't think so. I mean, he did... Some of the women he was having an affair with... There's not enough evidence to support that. It just kind of seemed like prostitutes would come into his office going, hey, I need an abortion. Yeah. And then he'd be like, here's an abortion. Oh, and I'll poison you too. How about that? Wow. And then... But like I said, but then he would write a letter to some prominent person and go, hey, you killed this girl. Or you knocked this girl up and killed her. So he he was trying to run some kind of an extortion scheme. Yeah. But like I said, I don't think it ever worked. Oh, ridiculous. I don't think it ever worked. Now, so he had apparently killed all these women up to this point and had gotten away with it. However, people got more suspicious when a man turned up dead, <laughs> which should tell you something right there. So this was in uh, this was in Illinois, actually. He was still in Chicago at this point. It was in 1881. A man named Daniel Stott. And he turned up dead after he had gotten a prescription from Dr. Cream, Dr. Moist. <laughs> after he had gotten a prescription because uh, Daniel Sott had epilepsy. So Dr. Cream's like, well, I can help you with that. Here's a prescription. Yeah. And then he died. He killed him. All right. Now, at first, the death was attributed to natural causes. He was an epileptic. He was in bad health. Right. No one thought anything about it. Hmm. Until Dr. Cream, retardedly, mm-hmm. wrote a letter to the coroner mm-hmm. and said... That the pharmacist was responsible for Daniel Stott's death and saying, give me money or I'm going to tell that to the cops. Hmm. Right? So. This is weird. It's I know. Weird, that's what I mean. Guy. It's like I said, this is like the dumbest. Like, why it's do you think. the dumbest MO ever. Yeah. It's so dumb. He just. uh You know, what's funny is that during this time, there was a lot of these fake doctors like J.J. Holmes. And yeah. All that. H.H. H. Holmes. H.H. H. Holmes. Is that his Yeah, name? he was not. Now, this guy was actually a real doctor, sp- real supposedly. Doctor. Yeah. Right. He had all the sh- he had all the paperwork and shit, and he apparently did go to colleges and whatnot. He just sounds more like a pathological liar, scam yeah. artist who uh, was Yeah, he's just, just like a fraudster sociopath who, and who he, was into murder and right. people. Well, he, he probably considered it like euthanasia, you know yeah. what I mean, where, oh, you know, your life, your life is unworthy of living anyway, so, you know, here, I'm going to put you out of your misery. And maybe make yeah. a buck off yeah, it. Yeah, try to make a buck off you. Right. Yeah, psycho. But so, here's the the dumb thing is that 
had he not written a letter to the coroner saying the pharmacist did it, mm-hmm. no one would have thought that the Daniel Stott murder was a murder. He fingered it himself. That's what I mean. All right. So it's almost like he wanted to get caught. Yeah, just an idiot. Okay, so he got arrested, and it turned out that he was fucking Daniel Stott's wife. What? And that Daniel Stott's wife had asked him to poison her husband. Whoa. But then she turned state's evidence and ratted him out. Wow. Ratted cream out, right? Jeez. And so I don't know if he thought, I don't know if she had money and you thought, oh, we'll bump off the husband and then you and me will share his life insurance. I don't know. I don't know if that's what he thought. Sounds like a, could it, could it, could this be more of a case of a quack doctor who's a sociopath trying to make a buck and then in the end gets hooked up with a, a bad woman who wants to kill her husband? Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's because he doesn't really sound like a typical serial killer with a sexual motive. Right. And a drive. Although, to I have to say, it. this is only, you know, at this point, this more shit happens. Oh, later. this is only part of it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. But, um. I don't know this case. This yeah. Is first, you know, first time I've really heard about it. So, yeah. So she narked on him. Now he got sent to. Now, so she got off. Okay. So he got a murder conviction. And this was at uh, Joliet Prison in Chicago. He was sentenced to life. However, he served, I think he served about 10 years. And then his brother um, made a quote unquote plea for leniency, mm. i.e. greased some palms. Sure. And, <laughs> and got Dr. Creamy let out. Oh, man. You could do that? You could get a man out of a life sentence with a bribe back then? Wow. Yeah. For murder. Wow. Of all yeah. things. Okay, so he gets out of Joliet Prison. Mm-hmm. Happy as a clam. Okay. Then he goes to England. Okay. London specifically. Now, he um, he did not actually live in Whitechapel. And it is thought that he did not arrive in London until 1891, which was a couple of years after the Ripper murders. Now, some people have said that, oh, he got out of prison earlier than than they thought you know so he could have been there at the time or a little more far-fetched a couple of writers have said oh well a, a look-alike served prison prison in his place or something i don't know if i really buy that so you know there's a possibility he could have been what is it the records time. from the time are a little spotty so yeah. we didn't really know okay. so they're not quite sure right. but um they think he was in prison in chicago when the murders were going on in london but they're not entirely certain uh, they think that he got to, uh, he arrived in Liverpool in 1891. Now, his father had died and left him a bunch of money. And that's what he used to uh, move to London. It must not have been a lot of money because he moved to Lambeth, which is kind of a shithole at the time. Right. Uh, you know, I don't know if it was as bad as Whitechapel, but, you know, right. same kind of thing. And as soon as he arrived on British shores, like I said, he learned nothing. Learned Very nothing. Good. So as soon as he got there... 19-year-old prostitute, Nellie Donworth. And he's like, hey, he's in a pub. Want a drink? Sure. Next day, she kills over dead from strychnine poisoning. Damn. Okay? And he didn't get anything out of that. I mean, I don't think. Oh, well, actually, actually, he did try to get something out of this same kind of way he did that. He kills a prostitute of ours, mm-hmm. giving her a drink with strychnine in it. She dies. And then when they're doing the investigation about her death, he did the same thing. He wrote a letter to the coroner and said, I know who the murderer is and I'll tell you for 300,000 pounds. What? <laughs> right. Damn. And he, and he wrote a letter to a guy named WFD Smith who actually, if you're from the UK, you'll know W.H. Smith, the bookstore. Okay, that was one of the original owners. That's a big book chain over there, kind of like Barnes & Noble over here. And uh, accused him of the murder <laughs> and said, give me money or I'm telling the cops. Oh, man, what a scammer. Right, okay. So then, and then it seemed like he kind of got away with that one. He kind of got away Why, with that. Why, they couldn't that. find out who Yeah, I guess they couldn't really find out anything about it. So they were just like, whatever. All right. And then... Uh, he met with a 27 year old prostitute named Matilda Clover. And he did the same thing to her. He just poisoned her. Yeah. She died the next day. Now this death was not initially thought a murder because she was an alcoholic and Mm -hmm. she was in bad health. They thought she just killed over dead because her liver gave out or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
And it would have stayed that way, again, mm-hmm. if this dumbass had not written a letter to another doctor in town and said, I know you killed her. Give me money. So he's done or this. Or I'm writing. Yeah. And he just keeps doing it. And as far as I know, no one gives him any money for yeah. shit. And yet he, he's, he's done this at least five, six times. And yeah. Yeah. And like I said. And this MO does not work. But no. You can, just and like I said, the murder the <laughs> that he was convicted of in Chicago, the murder of Daniel Stott, uh, would have been ruled a natural death if he right. had not done that and someone had gotten suspicious. And as you'll see, the murders that he did in England, the same shit happened. He right. would have skated. Man. If he hadn't done this kind of crap. Actually, let's take another but break. But he wouldn't have killed the woman had he thought, or had he, what's a good way to put it? He would have killed the woman had he had he thought that, or had he not thought that he would have made money. So right. Put it. I get, yeah. So he's I dumb enough to think that he's going to make money. Yeah. That's why he killed her. Dude's an idiot. He didn't learn. All right. I'm, I'm going to do a second break real quick right now, and then we'll come back and yeah. finish this case up, because this is like funny as hell. All right. Yeah. So we'll be back in just a minute. There are terrors, real and imaginary, and I write about them all. Paranormal nonfiction, horror fiction, the Rochdale House Poltergeist, of Fire the Whispers, Mammoth Mountain Poltergeist, the Associated Hopeful Monsters, Red Menace, the, the Five Tenebris, Bellwether. Go to www.jennyashford.com or search Amazon for the Jenny Ashford author page. Okay. So like I said, initially, prostitute Matilda Clover. They thought she had died from her alcoholism until Cream wrote a letter to a doctor, Dr. Broadbent, who was actually a pretty well-known doctor in the area, said, uh, you killed her, give me money or I'll tell the cops. And Dr. Broadbent, being no idiot, sent the letter to Scotland Yard. Yeah, right. Gotcha. (laughs) As you would. He's like, what the fuck is this about? Yeah. Now, uh, while that was all going on, it was just like a few days later. And this one was, this one was kind of odd because this one seemed like one where he didn't try to benefit off it. Cream's toddling around, runs into two prostitutes because he wanted two for the price of one, I guess. We wanted a challenge this time. Alice Marsh and Emma Shrivel, they were 21 and 18 years old, uh, was able to weasel his way into their flat. Okay. And... He had some bottles of Guinness. Hey, here you go. Drink some Guinness. They did. He left. And then they both died of strychnine poisoning. Damn. Several hours later. Wow. And I don't think that he attempted to get anything out of that. I guess he just did that one for shits and giggles, I guess. (laughs) Fucking freaking. I thought strychnine took a long time to kill you. You'd think it does. You'd think they'd run for help. Yeah. But maybe, maybe the dosage was real high. Yeah, and that's what I mean. Maybe play. they couldn't. Yeah. You know. Weird. Yeah, that's horrible. No necrophilia involved as far as they know. No, yeah, not that it was ever reported. Hmm. Huh. Unless. Unless the Victorians hadn't thought of that. Oh, I'm sure they Man, Maybe they that. did think of that, yeah. <laughs> In a lot of ways, like if you read some yeah. of the, uh, they loved all that sordid shit back then. I'm sure if yeah. somebody was fucking corpses, they'd have been all about that. God. They'd have drawn pictures of it and put it in the paper and everything. Right. Because, you know, like, even during the Ripper murders, they, like, had those horrible right. drawings of, like, look at all the intestines and yeah, <laughs> all this kind of shit. They were into that. So, so he kills all these women and probably would have just kept doing it and probably would have got away with it, except for sending all these dumbass letters. Right? Attempting to profit off of something. Attempting to profit, profit off of it. Yeah. Another thing he did too, while he was still free, like in the before, face of constant failure. He yeah, just keep like I said, I don't think anybody. I mean, right. the records don't show whether he ever got any of these yeah. people to be like, "Oh shit," to like give him money. Because why yeah. would you? Imagine You're like, he, I didn't kill anybody. He, <laughs> <laughs> why would you give somebody he's money? Back at, he's back at his place. Why isn't this working? It'll work this time. This time it'll work. I know, and that's what that's what cracks me up about this guy. It's like obviously it's horrible. He's a horrible, horrible person. Yeah, dumb. But stupid. Yeah, real dumb. Like, I mean, if you're going to, and I'm not advocating this. Unless it was some kind of a fetish. Maybe it was. I mean, I'm not advocating becoming a serial killer or anybody. I'm not saying that. But it's like, if you're going to kill people for profit, I mean, at least think it through a little bit. And if it doesn't work the first time and you didn't get caught, don't do it like that again. Yeah, weird. That didn't work. Mm -mm. Another stupid thing he did was, um, (laughs) he... 
He was fantasy prone. Yeah, I I guess. Yeah, he's living in a world of fantasy. So this uh, Cree met up with this policeman that he kind of knew, Mm -hmm. who was from New York City. And Cream was showing the policeman around Lambeth. Mm -hmm. And he's like, hey, want me to show you all the locations of the Lambeth Poisoner's victim? (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. (laughs) And... (laughs) That's and the good. policeman thought this was suspicious. And he also referred to Matilda Clover, one of the women that he had murdered. Mm-hmm. He referred to it as the murder of Matilda Clover, even though at the time they didn't know she'd been murdered. Yet. Uh, they thought she was, you know, it was yeah. just an alcoholic giveaway. death. Yeah. So he called it a murder and every, and the policeman was like, hmm. So he went to Scotland Yard and go, what the fuck? Can't yeah, yeah. this guy Was up? that a murder? Oh, yeah. was it? Well, there's a guy here that claims that it is. Yeah. yeah. He's like, and he showed me where all the victims yeah. were. And he seemed to know a lot about it. Right. All right, so Scotland Yard were like, okay, so they put him under surveillance. <laughs> they put him under surveillance and they saw him just toddling around to prostitutes all day long. They also mm-hmm. contacted uh, the police in Chicago. He mm-hmm. said, oh, yeah, that dude was in prison for poisoning people. Poisoning people, people yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was supposed to be and he probably should have still been in there. Sorry about mm-hmm. that. So, uh, yeah, we sent him over there to, like, kill your people now. So now he's your problem. So, <laughs> but finally, finally... After finding this out, Scott Lanyard finally arrested him in 1892. And uh, he was actually arrested for Matilda Clover's murder because he had pretty much said, uh, yeah, I murdered her because they didn't Mm. know it was a murder at the time. And then later he was charged with uh, four other murders, Nellie Donworth, um, Alice Marsh, and Emma Shrivel. And also, um, also an attempted murder. So I guess one of the, oh, because one of the prostitutes, he, Mm -hmm. they saw him, he picked up one of the prostitutes and he tried to give her something to drink or trying to give her some pills or something like that. And she got suspicious and she threw him in the river. She threw him in the river? No, she threw the pills in the river. Oh, okay. She threw the pills in the river because she was just like, she thought he was sketchy, I guess. Right, yeah. So, but, um, but so he was charged with the attempted murder there and he was also charged with extortion. Huh. Albeit the stupidest extortion in the history of extortion. And um, his defense was <laughs> that... This better be good. <laughs> it's not, I assure you. His defense was, I'm not that same guy. I'm only Dr. Thomas Neal. I'm not Dr. Thomas Neal Cream. Oh, okay. And so he's trying to say, that's not there's me. There's another guy. That's, yeah. There's another guy. Right. With a name almost like mine. Yeah. And that was... And it's funny because the newspapers at the time did refer to him as Dr. Thomas Neal, but it's that's right. not the same. That was his middle name. So, uh, yeah, they, so. That's a good way to, that's a good way to get out from underneath the whole thing though. Misidentification. Not me. Yeah. Not me. I mean, really, that's probably all he could have done at this point. Right. And he wasn't smart enough to figure out anything else (laughs) any good, obviously. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so he tried that and, you know, they saw through that in about five seconds. His trial only lasted three days. Okay. The jury deliberated a grand total of 12 minutes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dead to rights. Yeah. And they're like, pretty much, nope. Sorry yeah. about that. And yeah, so they Feet sentenced him. went swinging. Him. Yeah. So Feet they sentenced him to hang. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So it was less than a month later after his conviction. And then they hanged him at Newgate Prison. And then there was the whole story about, I am Jack the Ripper on the gallows oh yeah but like i said only eh. the hangman there's only the hangman's word for that that guy wasn't smart enough to be the river that no no and he was just begging for his life he was trying to delay the execution that's yeah. all that was that's and hearing actually the story now hearing the story now then yeah yeah that guy. actually is what it sounds like maybe right. he thought oh if i say that they'll they'll, de- they'll delay stop it. and they'll yeah they'll delay it yeah so he was trying to yeah retard so this guy in a way, he's come, yeah, he's a serial killer in the sense that he killed at least five people, probably right. more. There was a lot, I mean, they think he might have killed his wife too, but he never got pinned for that because natural causes. But you know how that yeah. goes around him. And uh, the weird thing about him, he, he seems a little different than George Chapman because, like we said, George Chapman didn't really seem to have any particular motive. He didn't get any financial gain out of anything or anything like Something that emotional yeah so i would think i mean of the two putting aside the fact that dr thomas neil cream they thought he might have been in prison in chicago at the time of the ripper murders which of course would have made it impossible for him to be the ripper he was actually considered as a suspect hmm. but 
like you said, it doesn't seem to fit. He doesn't seem like, I mean, not saying that Jack the Ripper was some fucking genius or anything like that. I mean, he must have been kind of well, cunning, at least, because he never got caught. He never got caught, right. Uh, even though he killed people in the middle of the street. I would say that, I would say that, the, that the Ripper was streetwise. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Cream wasn't. He no. didn't know human nature too well. No. Mm. And he was not, and I should say too, that he, I mean, he wasn't a native of London. Neither was uh, George Chapman. He was Polish, but he right. did live in that same area. So he was probably familiar with it. But, um, you know, Dr. Cream had kind of lived all over. He lived in Scotland, he lived in Canada, he lived in the US. And then he moved to London as an adult. But uh, he, the, he the, seemed like, it almost yeah. seemed like he... It seemed like he did get some thrill out of poisoning the women because some of them he did. He just poisoned prostitutes just for the fuck of it. Yeah. But in most cases, it seemed like he at least tried to get some kind of yeah, you know, financial I, gain out I, of I it. I think he was fantasizing that he was some kind of a brilliant crist- criminal mastermind, but right. was too dumb to but realize was too dumb to, to realize that he wasn't in, in the case of the Ripper. To be the Ripper, you'd have to be real uh, comfortable in Whitechapel. You'd have to know it real well. And I guarantee you, he was a regular. Those women, yeah. that, those women that he knew, he had, he'd probably done business with them before. I would well, think. yeah, because maybe they wouldn't have felt threatened then. They, they would have right. just gone with them. Yeah. And actually, even at the time, like I know in, in the subsequent years, like pretty much everybody has been accused right. of being there. I'm surprised. Surprise! I haven't been accused of being Jack the Ripper, even though I wasn't even alive. I had a time machine. I went back. I'd killed some prostitutes. But you know what I mean? Everybody was accused. But even back then, they said, whoever is doing this has intimate knowledge of Whitechapel. They are from here. I'm going to up it. I'm going to say the reason why he got away with it, the the Ripper, he got got away with it because he was known and well-liked. Yeah, I mean, that's it, why it wouldn't he surprise me. He was trusted; me. those girls trusted him. Yeah, and that's, that's because he maybe did. he was banging prostitutes all the time and not killing and them, and not killing them. And, and then, then just every now and then, he's right. just like, "Oh, seems like one of those days." He'd go Whack. on a murder spree. I, I bet you. Yeah, I bet you. And maybe he wasn't a weirdo. I mean, maybe he well, was pretty normal most of the time. Yeah, well, somebody that they knew and liked. I think. Yeah. That's how you would get away with that. Yeah. No suspicion. Right. Yeah. And you know, like I said, even though. Like I said, pretty Although much. I'm, the just only... say, I'm just saying that off the top of my head. Yeah. But I, you know, I would think I would think that they knew him and liked him. Yeah. Now, I mean, Doctor Cream was a prostitute guy. Went to yeah. prostitutes when they had him under surveillance. They said he was fucking toddling around in prostitutes all the it's time. Victorian era. But era, you know? yeah, true. They didn't date back then. They were either married or they were going out with hookers. Yeah. And that was another <laughs> or thing. Both. That, yeah. <laughs> and another thing that was weird is that these serial killers were killing women that they were marrying. Because yeah. in those days, you know, women were desperate to marry. They couldn't work. Yeah. So they didn't have to be a, a prowling, hunting type serial killer all the time like you'd have nowadays. Yeah. You could just marry some chick. Yeah. And kill her. And yeah. And move on, marry another one and kill her. And honestly, like I said. It would have been a serial killer's paradise. Uh, well, it was in yeah. many. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was in many ways. Sure. And in a lot of ways, it was kind of. That it was really bad. That's, oh, yeah. And particularly in those parts of London and stuff like that, because they couldn't catch you. No forensic technology. Right, exactly. No forensic science. I mean, that's what I mean. It, if if circumstances hadn't intervened, some of these guys might not have been caught. Especially no paperwork. If, yeah. Especially if, if they were poisoners, because yeah. they didn't have any, you know, you, you could, like you said, a guy could just marry a woman. Yeah. He could slowly poison her. It would yeah. seem like she died of consumption right. or died of fucking... So we have people were dying of shit back then all the time. There was no paperwork, no real bureaucracy that meant anything no dna yeah fingerprinting was new that was very much in the late 1800s yeah. no date criminal databases no, no communication between one county and the next one state and the next no federal database yeah so you all you had to do you commit a crime and move and then forge some documents yeah or buy forged documents. and it happened over and over and you could change your identity on a yearly basis they well, did I mean, it. I mean said look at this dr cream idiot yeah he was he was in prison yeah. For murder in Chicago, they let him out early. He moved to London. No one knows anything. During that same time, you know, people don't realize that the Wild West was going on at that yeah, time. Yeah, that too. too. And out in the West, you'd have guys who would be robbing trains one month. A year later, they're the sheriff in a town right. somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so morality was much sides. more fluid back then. <laughs> yeah, they played both sides. Of, they played both sides of the law back then. Yeah, that's you true. Know? And he might be a good sheriff. That'd be the weird thing. Yeah. You don't know. Well, you know, that's some of the skills as a train sure. robber would come in handy. Come in handy to catch criminals. Of course. Yeah. Well, I'm going to do this now for a living. 
Well, yeah. It was just a well, you're using your expertise. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's Well, it's almost kind of like how they use serial killers that are in prison to catch other serial killers. Right. Because who use, knows better how to yeah. think like a criminal than another criminal. I don't think they do that anymore. Probably I not. I think they have profilers now that can do all that. They just go they interview do. the... They go interview them. Well, I guess that's kind of like... Yeah. Kind of like helping them, but... I yeah, they, they go interview. That that's how they come up with profiles yeah. is from interviewing because they, they have a database. Of I all think of them. they know all the mo's and the certain psychologies behind yeah. these psych- serial killers for the most part now. Though I think they've identified the different types of them. Yeah, interestingly, we we actually since when we were doing uh, research for the show, we actually come across this uh, little documentary. I don't know what year it was from. It wasn't that old, but it was um, a guy who was speculating that it was a guy named Frederick Deeming, right? who was an Australian serial killer. I think he was originally from Britain, but then he moved to Australia later. And he hacked up his wife and four kids. And they think that he might have been the Ripper because his movements were very similar, too. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Like, he was in the UK when the murders were going on, and then they stopped when he left, and blah blah And... Remember they they said oh we think we're trying they were trying to get DNA off the stamp from one of the Jack the Ripper letters and yeah. then they, and they found out it was a woman's DNA didn't they which right. seemed kind of weird well it made sense though because they thought that the women at the post office probably licked the stamp for you yeah so. yeah which could have been that would have explained that right. and you know she could have been deeming I I had yeah. never really heard him put forward seriously until I saw this and I don't know if that guy was just a crackpot or not but it was mm. kind of interesting yeah. but like I said you know it was so long ago and. The only reason we're fascinated with it now, well, uh, aside from the brutality, is because they never caught the guy. And, never caught the guy. And there were so many suspects, and there's so many people it could have been. Yeah, th- there's a lot of serial killers they never caught, though. You just don't hear much about them. They never caught the original Night Stalker. I was going to say, the they Zodiac. never caught that, dude. Uh, they've uh, torn up houses that uh, had dead bodies underneath them that, would, that, that it happened sometime during the 20s or the 30s, you know? But it's like, know holy shit, that. we didn't even know about yeah, any of this. Yeah, didn't even know about it. That's really yeah. scary to think about. Yeah. That there's probably like all kind of <laughs> murders that happened that nobody ever... Right. I mean, because if no one ever reported you missing... Right. Back then, in those days... The, yeah, if somebody hard, murdered you, you would just... Disappear. Yeah, you just languish under some... Especially if you didn't have any house. family that was looking for you. And, they, and then your family could go looking for you, but they couldn't find anything because, you know, yeah. one state didn't... States right. and counties really didn't. And the thing about serial person. killers too is that the reason that it's so hard to catch them is because they kill random people. Yeah, no connection. I mean, you know, and that's another thing. I don't advocate this, you guys, but like, you know, if you're gonna commit a commit a murder, murder some fucker you don't know. Because <laughs> oh if God. you murder somebody oh. you do know, they'll catch you immediately. Yeah. <laughs> because it's almost always somebody the person knows. Yeah. <laughs> Stranger murder, very rare. Probably about time, huh? Yeah, we're coming up to the end of the show. Um, yeah. Hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and go like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. We're at 13 o'clock podcast. And is there anything else I usually say at the end? I can't remember now. Uh, nope. Not okay, don't, don't become serial killers, you guys. Uh-huh. And if you do, don't get caught. And we'll see you next week. Bye.